Thank you very much, Paul. Very kind introduction. And just on, on my name, yes, I mean, I'm always called Tim. So if you ever meet me in real life, please call me Tim. But uh, the real name is Timon, just like Simon, pronounced the same way. People pronounce it in weird ways sometimes. But anyway, um, as Paul said, I, I was 30 years at the University of London and I came to Japan on what was supposed to be a six month sabbatical at the beginning of 2020. And we all know what happened in that um, spring. And so I just never left. So I was in the very lucky situation of being offered a position at this place, Nichibunken in Kyoto, which is pure research. So um, I have no teaching responsibilities uh, at all. It's absolutely blissful. So I hope to see the remainder of my career um, out here. But anyway, when I came to Japan in 2020, my objective was to begin research on the subject of Nikko. And I'm sure many of you as interested people in Japan, living in Japan, wherever you happen to be, um, know about Nikko. Uh, and you've probably been there. It's, as Paul said, the mausoleum, part temple, part shrine, part grave of Tokugawa Ieyasu, who died in 16, 1616. And for those of you who think in uh, European terms a bit, as I often do, uh, he died um, within a month of Shakespeare. So that's the kind of time frame that we're thinking of. But of course, unlike Shakespeare, who's long gone, um, Iyasu is still there as a divinity. Not many people probably believe in him anymore as a divinity. But uh, throughout the Edo period, he was venerated in very specific ways. And I'll, as much time as permitted, I will tell you about that today. But um, this is the course of a book. So if you'll permit myself a promotion in um, a year or so's time, I'm touching wood as I say that, there will be a book out. Uh, the tentative title is um, Shogun Avatar. Uh, and then the subtitle will be the, the Veneration of Tokugawa Iyasu in Nikko and throughout early modern Japan. Well, you all know the word Shogun. I don't have to explain that. Um, you probably know the word avatar, but you may be surprised to hear it in this context. So one of the things I will explain is what that means. So let's begin um, at the beginning, which actually is before the death of Ieyasu, because obviously he became an old man and people were thinking ahead about what should happen when he died. And he'd already handed over his um, role as shogun to his son, Hide, um, uh, Hide Tada. So he was living in retirement in Shizuoka, which in those days was called Sumpu. He was in Sumpu Castle. And it's a very nice place to be. Shizuoka happens to be one of my favorite places in Japan. You see the um, Mount Fuji very clearly. You're right by the, the, the sea. And so on his death, uh, that's where he was. And people looked back to um, what they should do. And there was one very clear precedent, which is that Hideyoshi, uh, who'd never become shogun, but he'd become... Uh, imperial minister he'd had a kind of different route Iyasu remained as a military figure Hideyoshi though initially a warlord uh, turned himself into a kind of courtier he died in Kyoto and his burial of course was going to be a natural precedent for um, Iyasu because both he and Hideyoshi they kind of came from nowhere there was no obvious way in which they would be buried so um <coughs> this is what they did for Ieyasu. Uh, and we'll look at how it works as a precedent, Hideyoshi's precedent in a second. But you can it's a Shinto shrine. It doesn't take much to tell that. Um, but it's a Shinto shrine of a rather... Well, of course, all Shinto shrines have a sanctum, uh, the, the um, Honden, in which there will be some kind of representation of the divinity, often in the form of a jewel or a mirror or a sword, very infrequently uh, an icon like, you know looking like a person or something, but sometimes you get that. And then in front of it, so if it's a small shrine, you just stand in front. But if it's a grand one like this, the, the shrine has the second hall in front, which is the Haiden, the prayer hall, in which the rituals take place. But if you have a grand shrine, those two buildings are separate. And you'll have seen them separate in many places. Or they may have a kind of link just so that uh, it keeps the rain off. But then here, it's actually a conjoined building with a additional roof across the, the top. And this was known as the Yatsumune style, the eight ridge poles. And as you know, in Japanese, eight doesn't mean eight. Eight means um, a lot, like in English, we say 101. So eight ridge poles just means to support the additional roof. It had to have architectural um, supports. And that style already existed. Why did they choose that style? And what did that style mean? Um, before I, I should have um, mentioned that <clears throat> Iyasu died in 16, 
16, but it of course took some time to erect things. So what we have there is from 1617, and it was built on this mountain outside um, Shizuoka called Mount Kuno. So <clears throat> they copied Hideyoshi basically, but we don't know exactly what Hideyoshi looked like because it's no longer there, but it does figure in some screen paintings. So this is a, <clears throat> a well-known screen of the genre of um, views in and around the capital, which was popular in Japanese history. And of course, um, it tends to be fairly accurate panoramic views. So here <clears throat> we have, sorry, up there, just up there is on the, on the right-hand side, there's a detail. You can see that it's a shrine precinct with conjoined roofs. So uh, obviously that's what was done for Ieyasu following Hideyoshi. And the reason Hideyoshi had that <clears throat> is because he was deified as a certain kind of Shinto kami. Now, this is really unexpected and remarkable because although in ancient Japanese history, there are some cases of human beings being deified, it's extremely rare. And in virtually all places, it's a member of the imperial family. So Hideyoshi was an upstart. He came from a modest background, and yet <clears throat> he was deified. And <clears throat> so they looked for a precedent for that happening. Can we find a human being who was um, deified but wasn't a member of the imperial family? And there's one very good precedent hundreds and hundreds of years before, which was Sugawara no Michizane. You may know him as Tenjin, one of the three most venerated kami in Japan still today. He's known as the god of, uh, of letters, right? Jap Japanese shrines, you know, there's, of course, 30,000 or so of them. About a third are to Tenjin, about a third are to Inari, and about a third are to Hachiman, right? So um, very highly venerated. And the point is that the shrine to um, Tenjin in Kyoto was also in the Yatsumane way. So it becomes regarded as the way in which you should enshrine somebody who's not a member of the imperial family. Previously, there'd only been this one case. Now there's a second case with Hideyoshi. And then there's a third case with Iyasu. And the type of divinity this person was is called a Myojin. There it's down the bottom. A Myojin, a bright kami. Uh, no need to go into details, but kami are all kinds of grades and things. So this also was sometimes called the, um, the Myojin style. So there we have it. Ieyasu, at the end of a long and illustrious life, was buried as a Shinto god of the type called a Myojin, just as Hideyoshi had been. All done and dusted. But within a matter of weeks, this figure turned up. This figure turned up. His name is Tenkai. And he was a very powerful Buddhist priest. He was already aged. He's I think already, and we can see he was born in 36. So by the time he has to die, he was almost 80. And he came along and said, no, 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 this is completely incorrect. What you've done is, 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 is not right. Iyasu will have to be dug up and re-deified a second time in a completely different way. Because he said, I taught Iyasu secret teachings, which he followed. And he would not have wanted to be buried in the way you buried him. Now, of course, Tenka was putting a fast one. There was no evidence for this at all. But whoever controlled Ieyasu's dead body, which potentially is a huge site of veneration, of pilgrimage, of pious offerings, whoever had that body was going to be a very, very powerful and significant person. And Tenkai fancies himself in that role. So he said, Ieyasu has to be dug up and moved to another site, which is more propitious. And guess what that other site should be? Of course, it was Tenkai's temple, because he was already the abbot of a very big temple outside um, Tokyo, outside Edo. And the change that he wanted is that Ieyasu was buried as a Shinto god. That's fine, we know what Shinto gods are. But there's some Shinto gods, in fact, in the early days, many, although things changed a lot in Meiji, many Shinto gods are avatars of Buddhas. That is to say, they derive their capacity and power not from themselves. They, devise, they derive their power from a Buddha. Now, Buddhas are extinct, 
Therefore, they cannot function in our world. If you pray to a Buddha, there's no point. That, it can't do anything for you. A Buddha can be a role model or a teacher and follow their teachings, but you can't. they can't intervene. They can't marry your daughter for you or cure, cure your toothache or make you rich. But they can operate via kami, who can appear in our world. Right? Hence, they are known as avatars. In Japanese, the word is gongen. So Tenkai says, Ieyasu must be a gongen. Of course, he's a Shinto monk. Uh, he, he's a Buddhist monk, which means that Ieyasu has moved out of pure Shinto and put into a Buddhist syncretic world in which Tenkai will be able to do much more. So if Ieyasu is going to be an avatar, he has to be an avatar of some Buddhist figure. And Tenkai said he is an avatar of the Buddha of medicine, Yakushi Nyorai. There were several reasons why he said that. One is that Tenkai's own particular religious affiliation was a Tendai based on Mount Hiei outside um, Kyoto, the principal icon of which is the Medicine Buddha. So he's basically saying, I want Iyasu to come into my fold uh, in Buddhist theology. The other reason, though, is that or, and another reason is that the paradise of the Medicine Buddha is said to lie in the east. And, of course, Iyasu died in the East. Edo is in the East. So Iyasu was a kind of protector of an easterly direction, the Tokugawa regime from Kyoto, which is the center, it's not the East. Um, but um, a third reason may be that Iyasu kind of cured Japan, right? The 100-year civil war of Japan, the whole 16th century civil war, the country was bleeding. Right. People were, were, were dying, uh, famines, you know, all, all horrible things you get in, in, in war and you think of plenty of places around the world at present. Iyasu had cured that. He had been a kind of a physician for the realm. And the medicine Buddha was not only somebody that cured you, he also was regarded as a figure who cured the state. Right. So this was a very um, sensible, cleverly organized um, um, system that Tenkai set up. You can tell, by the way, uh, the Buddha, Buddha of medicine when you see him because he has in his hands here uh, a jar of medicine, a vial of medicine. And uh, Tenkai concocted a kind of story that Ieyasu throughout his life had been interested in medicine. He had practiced medicine in retirement. Tenkai brought out all his um, equipment that supposedly Ieyasu had, had, had used to um, cure people and symbolically to cure the state. So the beautiful building that we just saw set up outside uh, Shizuoka uh, in replication of the one to Hideyoshi in Kyoto was not abandoned, but it was left and the body was dug up and moved to Tenkai's temple which was in Nikko. So now Nikko enters the story. Nikko was an ancient holy place, but rather remote for much of Japanese history. Here we have a map, I'm sure you know. This is where Edo is. So Shizuoka is down here, right? Here is Mount Fuji. Uh, this is Edo, Tokyo. And Nikko is almost exactly directly north. You go up here, it's quite easy walk. You can see it's pretty flat. And then there's hills behind Nikko and his Chuzenji Lake. Some of you have probably been to it. Very nice place. So as a point of pilgrimage, it's a quite convenient and easy thing. It's an old holy site. And but most importantly, Tenkai now has the body. Uh, Iyasu is a divinity, a Shinto god as an avatar. And so next to his original mausoleum, which I just show, showed you, they build a second hall donated to the Buddha of Medicine. And at Nikko, they build a shrine mausoleum with a temple of the Buddha, Buddha of Medicine inside it. And it's still there. If you've been to Nikko, you would have seen the, um, the, 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 the hall to the Buddha of Medicine next to the, in part within the shrine. So um, this is what he did. And the building he um, erected to uh, house this new divinity was absolutely not in the Myojin style or the eight ridgepole style, which would have associated it with a human kami, right? This is different. This is an avatar. And uh, the shrine um, 
uh, structure for that was not particularly fixed. So he just basically enough not to conjoin the main hall and the prayer hall. And in fact, what he did is he built the prayer hall. Here it is. You go inside and that's where the prayer halls are. The sanctum where the icon of the object of the of the kami is actually stored was the grave itself which i've shown you on the left that today has been changed and if you've been to nickel you'll see it's different today but it was originally looking like this so we have we have two um two halls and beside it was a hall to the buddha of medicine so iyasu is redefined reburied the whole thing is changed and it's again done and dusted. Hidetada um, Iyasu's son, the second shogun, died and handed on to his son, Iyasu's grandson, the third shogun, Ie Mitsu. And Ie Mitsu was often very unwell. He was not a healthy man, poor chap. And whenever he had terrible bouts of fever, he would pray to the Buddha of medicine. That's what anyone would do. Of course, the Buddha of Medicine can't appear in this world, but he can appear via his avatar, which is Iyasu. And so effectively, Iyamitsu was praying to his grandfather, and he kept on recovering. So he realized that this is a very powerful divinity. And his decision was, on the 20th anniversary, because he was shogun at that point, the 20th anniversary of Iyasu's reburial at Nikko, he would tear the whole thing down, and rebuild a much grander and better spot. A much grander and better spot, which is the Nikko you see today. Uh, it was more uh, simple before, and now the whole thing, as you know, is gold and lacquer. It was restored at great expense recently. The, in fact, the restoration isn't quite finished yet, so definitely worth the trip, even if you have been before, and uh, centered on this um, entrance gateway, the gate of solar brightness, the Yor Me Mon. And uh, there we have um, Iyasu reinstalled. And Nikko became a site of um, pilgrimage and of veneration. And <clears throat> Walk Japan might want to do this one day. You can walk from Nihonbashi in central uh, Tokyo, Edo, to Nikko along the old Nikko Highway, which is called the Nikko Dochu. It's a lovely walk. I, I've done it. And it takes you four days. And it's um, a route that many, many people took, partly because they wanted to be politically um, uh, advantageous to show the shogun that they were venerating his, uh, his ancestor. But also they genuinely believed that if they went there, they would get cured. And people genuinely did get cured at Nikko. Now, partly because a lot of physical ailments are to do with stress and fatigue and whatever, and a, kind of a bit of a holiday, uh, we all know, is restorative. And Edo people didn't really have a holiday, but if you went on a pilgrimage, that was legitimate. And Nikko was the easiest and best pilgrimage to make from, from Edo. I mean, you're not dragging yourself all the way down to, to, to Ise or something. So uh, um, people went, had a trip. It's not a hard walk. There's onsen all along the way. There's lovely sake, and uh, you get refreshed. Uh, also, Nikko has extremely rich plant life. So even before, you know, re re even regardless of the cult of, 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 the, of Iyasu at Nikko, physicians went to the Nikko mountains to gather um, herbal remedies. So the whole place becomes associated with cure uh, in the way that Iyasu cured um, the state. When uh, the rebuilding took place in 1636, um, 20 years after the death, uh, the link to the Medicine Buddha was, of course, um, remade as well. They, they rebuilt not just the grave and the mausoleum and the shrine bit, but also the, the temple bit. And it so happened that the correct way to venerate the Buddha of Medicine is via lanterns. Now, um, you've seen shrines and temples around Japan. They all have lanterns and, and Christian churches have lanterns. I mean, it's not, not special to have venerate divinities by lanterns, but the Buddha of Medicine was specifically venerated by what were called life prolonging lanterns in Japanese, Zoku Me To. And we find this going right back to the earliest um, 
Buddhist iconography that exists in East Asia, which is Chinese from the sixth century, Dunhuang, these cave temples in remote part of China, where here we already see in the sixth century, sorry, it's a very damaged image, but the Buddha of medicine being venerated by here, um, what they referred to as cartwheels sized lanterns. So uh, this is a specific kind of veneration to the Buddha of medicine. Now, when Iyasu died initially, they hadn't made a big deal about that. But at the rebuilding, Iyamitsu the Shogun asks people to donate lanterns, specifically life prolonging lanterns. Of course, he is now in the third generation of Tokugawa rule. Iemitsu was the first shogun who'd never fought on the battlefield. He didn't know anything about warriorhood. Um, and they do worry that the shogunal regime might collapse. After all, Japan had, had so many false starts and fallen back into civil war again. Iemitsu being ill, he had no children. And um, so there's partly the idea of um, re-engaging this notion of the B Buddha of medicine protecting the state was very politically necessary uh, as the Tokugawa enters into a different mode of practice post-peace. Um, and so various people offer lanterns. And all the daimyo, uh, you know, Japan is ruled by about 250 daimyo, they all offer lanterns, but some of them offered some rather particularly clever ones. And take, for example, Date Masamune. Date Masamune was um, a great warlord who'd fought alongside Ieyasu. They were close friends. The Date had married into the Tokugawa, and Ieyasu had given Masamune the um, wealthy domain of Sendai. So again, lots of lots of Date stuff if you go up to Sendai. And but Masamune had another interesting feature, which is that he had sent the only embassy to Rome that took place during the, um, just before the Edo period, actually. Uh, well, no, just into the Edo period, a big pardon. Uh, um, so there'd been a period, but um, that's nothing to do with it. When Edo power comes, Masamune sent an embassy to Rome. He wasn't himself a Christian, but uh, they were keen for things that might come from Europe. And subsequently under Itetari Iemitsu, um, trade with the outside world other than Holland, as you know, was banned. So he was a kind of leftover from a period of internationalism, which had now passed. And so when he gives lanterns, what he decided to do was make them out of Portuguese gun barrels. Take a look at it. There are two. This is a shadow here. This is the one I focused on. At the bottom of this of this shrine entrance, which you just saw, the Yorme Mon, there are two huge Portuguese metal iron barrels turned into lanterns. So these had come to Japan to threaten Japan, right? Um, the Portuguese were going to bombard Japan if they didn't do what the Japanese wanted. And now they've been turned into something at the service of the um, medicine Buddha. It's like in Christianity where they talk about turn your turn your swords into plowshares, right? Turn your arms of weapons, turn your weapons into something beneficial. That's what's being done here to illuminate the um, ancestor of the Tokugawa family. Normally, by the way, when you don't donate lanterns to temples, you donate pears. So he gave two. And Iemitsu was clearly so delighted by this gift, he planted, he put the lanterns there right in the most prominent place. Another person gave a very interesting lantern. In this case, it was a single one she gave, a woman. I'll tell you why it was single in a second. But this was given by Iemitsu's sister. Iemitsu's sister had gone and married the emperor. This is quite extraordinary that a warlord's daughter sister married the emperor that's a whole different story and the emperor of course was not at all happy that he'd been forced to marry um, a military woman but her name was Tokugawa Masako she has the honorary name Tofukumon in there is her portrait sculpture and on the left is the statue is the lantern that she gave it's also in metal, but unlike the previous one, which is Portuguese iron, this is made of bronze. And there is a history of donating bronze lanterns in Japan. They are regarded as more honorific than a stone lantern. Of course, they're more expensive, they're more skilled, they're harder to, to make. Um, so a bronze lantern, it's the best kind. But this one, you see, has like open work 
casting along the top. If it was ever lit, these um, flying angels would appear lit really to kind of be um, um, floating around offering protection. And this lantern is a very clear reference to another very similar lantern, which exists in Nara. And again, I'm sure most of you have been to Nara, to the Todaiji, the Great Eastern Temple, where in front of the main Buddha hall is a single lantern. It's not a pair, and that's why she only gave one, where it's grander, it's bigger, but it's the same effect with flying um, beings who've come down from the heavens and waft around in front of the hall. Uh, so what had been the Tordaiji lantern is replicated in Nikkor. Now, the Tordaiji lantern was really a special one because the Tordaiji was the greatest temple in Japan at the time, and it was built specifically by the emperor to cast the emperor's power over the whole country, right? The Tordaiji exists today singly, but originally it was the as the hub of a web of temples spreading throughout Japan called the Kokubunji, the, the, the National Division Temple. Every province in Japan had a Kokubunji that was um, um, dependent on the Todaiji in, in, in Nara, but the Kokubunji had all fallen away over history. And the Todaiji too had been completely lost. So if you go there today, there's a beautiful huge building and all the tourists look at it, but that building's completely new. It wasn't there in the early Edo period. In fact, the whole Tordaiji was in total ruins. The only thing which existed from the great dedication um, 800 years before was the lantern. Literally, this lantern kept alive the flame of imperial patronage of, Buddh of Buddhism throughout Japanese history. And it's been replicated at Nikko. Now, they seem to be saying the Tokugawa are taking over this role of um, cherishing the state and making Japan a good Buddhist country. So that's two rather extraordinary lanterns have been put at Nikkor, but there's a third. The Tokugawa were very happy to take over this role that the emperors had had, but fundamentally, of course, the Tokugawa are shoguns. And as such, they look back to the first shogunate in Kamakura. And they even claim to be descendants of the Kamakura shoguns, which was a fib, but uh, that's what they said. And the Kamakura shoguns had also donated a pair of lanterns that were astronomically famous, also in a temple in Nara, and they're still there to be seen, which are um, by this artist called Corben, very well-known family of sculptors. You may have heard of the artist called Unke, who was his um, son. Uh, Kofukuji uh, in Out of the Great Temple has them, and they're converted demons, right? They, they, they were Oni, but now they've embraced the light of the Dharma, and they're holding it aloft. So this pair of lanterns were well known and were associated with the um, piety of the early Kamakura shoguns, and so they are replicated at Nikkor too. In fact, they're replicated twice. Um, here we have them, Oni. Uh, they're not copies. Uh, they are references, homages. They are not, I mean, they could have stolen, they could have gone down to the Corfu and says, we'll have those. Um, you know, the Shogun could take things from people if he wants, but they didn't want to do that. They wanted to inherit, right? We are now um, uh, like a relay race. We're the ones who are now doing what previous powerful regimes had had. We are the Tokugawa. Our regime is here to stay. Let me continue with lanterns for a little bit longer. And when my eventual book comes out, there will be a whole chapter on lanterns. It's not the whole story of Nikko, but it's an interesting feature of them. Who else might want to offer a lantern in Japan? We've seen a great warlord. We've seen the imperial family. We've seen here a reference to the Kamakura. Well, the Dutch East India Company is operating in Japan as the only surviving relic of Japan's old international trade. No more sending embassies to Rome, no more Portuguese and Spanish, no more English, no more um, Siamese, Vietnamese, uh, Koreans. They all were there before, but now they're all gone. Only um, rough trade with China, mostly uh, illicit. Otherwise, there's trade with Ryukyu's, that's a different story, or with Holland. So 
somebody probably says to the Dutch, uh, if you want to get on the Shogun's good side, we strongly suggest you send a life prolonging lantern. And why not send one that looks Dutch and foreign and exciting and Japanese won't have seen such a thing before. And the Dutch uh, um, were very keen to do this because in fact, they'd got themselves into an embarrassing situation. One of their um, senior officers had committed a, um, a grievous offense and it, Deeply offended, the shogun Iemitsu is in is is in enraged against the Dutch. He's even talking about possibly banning them from coming to Japan, and so the Dutch are really worried. and And so somebody says a lantern is the best way. The shogun is sure to love it, and um, it's and it'll get you off the hook. So they sent a lantern. Indeed, we probably would refer to this as a chandelier. It's the kind that would hang from the ceiling in um, a Dutch palace or more likely in a Dutch church. Of course, Nikko is not a palace, it's a religious institution. And Japanese temples, buildings didn't have high ceilings like Dutch churches do. So the lantern was placed on the ground. Outside, Japanese lanterns are, of course, placed outside. And in an earthquake zone with fears of fire, the last thing you want is a chandelier with <laughs> 30 burning candles inside a building. So that's where it's put. And being outside, it tarnished very fast, but it's a gorgeous thing. And it's put inside a gorgeous shrine building. Uh, if you want to, um, you can see it through the net and it's still there, right? And so it's actually right in front of the Yomimon. So Date Masamune's ones are at the bottom of the steps leading up. The Empress's one is inside the shrine precinct because she is royal blood or married into royal blood this is um denoted by as they were said a foreign king actually holland was a republic it didn't have a king but the dutch always fake it and pretend that they have a king because the japanese understand that system better republic doesn't sound very um stable to to the to the mind of east asians at the period so this lantern is brought and um tenkai who we already know set this thing up as the abbot of nikko he wrote about it and he said the Tata Emperor, that's the Chinese Emperor, said, Renown, though it have no wings, flies far. The way of Buddhism, though it have no roots, is firm embedded. This is a famous quote. And then he explains what he means. This being so, from foreign lands, they sent gifts of lanterns to the great avatar, Ieyasu. In these you may discern the life prolonging lanterns used in the veneration of the Buddha of medicine. As all know, the root ground, that's the Buddha from which the avatar comes, is called the root ground. The, the root ground of the great avatar of, Easter, of Ieyasu is the Buddha of medicine, whose name is heard far and wide. Rare indeed to find one who does not know him. All things come together, even thus is it so. In other words, he's saying the wondrousness of Tokugawa Ieyasu as an avatar is even known of at the most distant parts of the world, and they are sending gifts of life-prolonging lanterns to venerate him. That proves, right, that proves how wonderful, how respected Ieyasu is across the globe. Now the Dutch um, um, really did the right thing here. Ieyasu was, uh, Iemitsu the Shogun was so delighted, he sent it to Nikkor, as we've seen, placed it in front of the gate, and he, um, restored the Dutch privileges, which they'd lost because of their offensive behavior. Now that um, lantern that came, it still survives so it can be studied. And it's exactly the kind you'd have had hanging in a Dutch church. Many of these Dutch churches lost their lanterns during the Second World War. So you probably can't see them today, but they do survive in pictures of church interiors. So here we have on the great church in Harlem outside Amsterdam, 14. Um, the painting is from 4 1648, so just a decade after um, Iemitsu rebuilt Nikko. And there you see a lantern hanging uh, in a church. This is the kind of thing. So the Dutch have given a Christian um, object to the veneration of the avatar. Uh, actually, more specific than that, the great the new church in Delft, this is not the same church, we just saw a different one, has also a lantern. This is one of the great churches of Holland, the great, the new church in Delft. It had a very big lantern. 
in front of a very big grave. And that grave, here we see a better image of it, was the grave of William the Silent. William the Silent was the founder of the Dutch state. He, was no, he is still known in Holland as the father of the fatherland. He set up Holland as a country fit for the early modern age, exactly as Ieyasu set up Japan as a um, country fit for the early modern age. And so just when William the Silent died, you can see um, he was rapidly buried and not much was done. But as Ieyasu is being reburied, at Nick Corn's grand new shrine 20 years on, by complete coincidence, William the Silent is also being um, rehoused in a much better grave in Holland. And the lantern that they hang in front of um, their own national founder is exactly the same as the one they hang in front of Iyasu. So there's the one in front of the grave of William, William Silent, and there's the one in front of Ieyasu. And they probably were made by the same person because there weren't that many craftspeople competent to make lanterns of this um, size and, 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 and polish, literally polish um, and, and grandness. So there you have Ieyasu and William the Silent. Um, now, there's no document saying, let's make a parallel, but the parallel is very visible to see and I think it must surely have been on the minds of some people involved with this process. <clears throat> the donation of the lantern um, was so uh, effective in having Dutch privileges restored that the Dutch said to themselves, let's give a second one. They may at this stage have learnt that the practice in Japan is to donate paired lanterns. This one, they'd only sent a single one. You should really donate paired ones. And they also seem to have learned that Japan doesn't have um, tall ceilings. So you can't hang a lantern as you would in Holland. It stands on the floor, which is a bit sad, really. Right. So when they commission and send the second lantern, they put it on a stand. And they also send a pair. And this time we know the name of the maker used Gerritz, who's a very famous person in the history of Dutch applied arts. He probably had made the first one too, but that we don't know for a fact. And he's rather cleverly altered it slightly because the hanging ones, the, the arms hang down. And here the arms have kind of like, you know, they're heading upwards, it's a little bit different. And probably to a Dutch viewer, it looks a bit strange, but it works better in the Japanese context. And so this pair of new lanterns, second set, arrived in the capital of the Dutch East Indies, which was um, on Java. They don't go, they don't sell direct from Holland to Japan. They always stop on Java, which is their big capital and entrepot. And the governor of the Dutch East Indies sees them and is very impressed. This is going to be a great present for the Shogun, he thinks. We'll get even more privileges. But unknowing, not knowing the Japanese practice, of donating paired lanterns. The governor said, well, then one, one is unique and the shogun will think it's fantastic, and, but sending two, it's like, there's lots of them. So he held back one of the lanterns and only sent one. So if you go to Nikko today, there is just one, although it's placed opposite the first one. So you, have a, you do have a pair, although they are not an identical pair because one's on the stand and the second one was not put inside any kind of a shrine, it stands out in the open, but very prominently positioned in front of the Your Maimon. The making of this second lantern, or actually pair for Japan, was well known in Holland. And we have a very interesting comment left about it by somebody who wasn't entirely happy, he liked the idea of these Christian ornaments going to Shinto temples. After all, Christianity is a monotheism, as the Jewish God said, quoted in the Christian context, I, your God, am a jealous God. You should have no other gods but me. It doesn't, it's not good for Christians to give things to non-Christian signs, but the Dutch, you know, they're merchants, they don't really care. So they send these things off and they're subject to a, a kind of um, rather comic criticism by this fellow called Jan Vos, who was a well-known 
um, satirical writer in Holland at the time. And he wrote this JG, JG is Jack, yeah, yeah, used to get it. JG was unwilling to make a copper crucifix. I'll explain that in a second. He wouldn't make a crucifix, he refused. I'll, I'll explain why. Uh, but he was willing enough to make a copper lantern to burn before an idol representing the emperor of Japan. That's his little line. And then he writes a little poem, doggerel poem. A hypocrite once refused to make a copper crucifix. Yet now he's gone and made something to blaze before an image of the devil. Oh, yes, it will bring him to light candles for the sake of cash. The, the point about the crucifix is that the Dutch were are uh, Protestants. And Protestants do not accept crucifixes, right? A crucifix is a cross with the, the body on it, which is very Catholic. So um, in Dutch churches, you would never have a, a crucifix. And obviously somebody asked JG to make one. And very properly as a good Protestant, he'd refused, even though he would have got a lot of money for it. He wouldn't do it. And yet... He's gone and made one a lantern to hang in front of the devil, right? How naughty, right? And anyway, we know that all across Holland or all across Amsterdam, people knew what was happening up at Nikkor. Anyway, um, only one lantern goes on to Japan. So you may say to yourselves, what happened to the second one? It's not really part of our story, but let me just tell you. As far as the East India Company is concerned, the most important trading partner they have in Asia is the Shogun. So he's number one. But the second most important trading partner, partner is the Mughal emperor in India. And it so happens that the Mughal emperor at this time was called Aurangzeb. And uh, he had allowed the Dutch to trade in his empire. And so they owed him one as well. And so the second lantern went to Lahore, where the uh, Indian capital was at the time. And uh, Aurangzeb received it. Interestingly enough, the Mughal emperor cannot accept a present made in bronze because it's a base metal, but he liked the shape. So he had his craftsmen copy it four times, twice in gold, twice in silver. Sadly, the precious metal copies uh, do not exist, neither does the original Dutch one. They can't be found anywhere in India. They must have been melted down or something happened to them. Anyway, one of them goes on to Japan, as we see, and stands in front of the grave at Nikko. There it is in an old photograph. Now, <clears throat> the king of Korea, the Choson kingdom, uh, is also involved in diplomatic relations with Japan. And you might think he should send a lantern too. But Korea was very admired for bell making and a shrine temple does require a bell so probably somebody said to the king of korea um would you mind donating a bell for nikkor and it'll really um, be uh, much appreciated by the shogun and the king of korea did so and it was sent and so the first dutch lantern here we're looking um to the side so the your main mon entrance is as it were to the left and we've got the second dutch lantern which you can see there and um, the Korean bell with somebody reaching up to touch it in this old photograph. It says um, bros bell, obviously bronze bell. Uh, so we have um, a Korean bell and a Dutch lantern on one side. And the other side is a second or the first Dutch lantern. Now, some mention that the uh, King of Holland has given us two lanterns. Okay, you should give pairs, but the King of Koreans, the King of Korea has given something. King of Holland has given something. What about the third king that we have diplomatic relations with, the King of the Ryukyus, today Okinawa, at this time still an independent kingdom? The King of the Ryukyus had not got around to giving anything. So the Japanese fake it, and they say the second lantern was given by the King of Ryukyu, which, which, which it wasn't. They must have known it was not true, but it looks better if the three kings of the world have all given uh, a present to Nick Kaur. And we know this from a poem written by a very distinguished writer. Sorry, I didn't give the Roman letters. Uh, Hayashi Razan 
who was a great uh, scholar of the period, and he was a shogun's librarian. And he wrote this verse in classical Chinese, which I've made an effort to put into English. The dignity of the spirit of Eastern Radiance. Eastern Radiance, Toshu, right? Toshu Gu is the name of the Nikko Shrine. This means Yeyasu. The dignity of the spirit of Eastern Radiance is implanted even in foreign lands. Myriad peoples wish to do it honor. Its virtue wafts like fragrance. From the luminescent seas of Luchu, that's what the Okinawans call Okinawa, uh, the Japanese pronounce it with an R, Ryukyu, but Okinawan language doesn't have an R, they have an L like Chinese. So uh, from the luminescent seas of Luchu, they have sent us this dragon lantern. It's actually Dutch, but they say it's Korea, Luchu. Whales blow poetically. From the frosty peaks of Korea, sorry, the frosty peaks of Korea respond in lion-like roars. So the sound of the bell being equated with the roar of a lion, which is an old metaphor for the word of Buddhism, and the um, whales that go around Okinawa are spurting out water, looking like sparkles are on a lantern. It's a very uh, well-written poem, and uh, but it's, it makes a historical statement which um, Hayashi Razan must have known was not true. The Dutch, blissfully unaware that their second gift has been reattributed to the Korean king, send a third lantern. And they can't stop. And this third lantern was even bigger and even better than the other two. It was completely unique. It had a lantern a bit like the two we already saw, made by Joost Geritz. But outside, it had this extraordinary gilded housing, which is um, uh, turned to, to, to black, done by another well-known craftsman called Johannes Lutmer. And on the left side, you're seeing Johannes Lutmer's um, great masterpiece, which is the choir screen in Amsterdam New Church, another important Dutch church. Here we have it. So and this is the former queen of the Netherlands going to, to view it after restoration. So um, really the East India Company has not spared a penny to do the best possible stuff. They, they value their trade with Japan that highly. And the third lantern was sent to Nikko, where it was put on the left side. So as you walk to the, up to the gate of solar brightness, you want me on the left-hand side, you've got the first and the third Dutch lanterns. And on the right-hand side, you've got the second Dutch lantern and the Korean bell. So you have two pairs of objects to pass between to enter the gate. Uh, this third lantern, um, well, the king of Korea gave a bell and that's what he'd asked to give and that's very nice, but he hadn't given a lantern. So this third bell is unilaterally declared to be a gift from the king of Korea. Uh, now we have all three kingdoms with which Japan has official trade, Holland, Ryukyu, and Korea, have all given life-prolonging lanterns to uh, prolong, um, to venerate the medicine Buddha, who protects the state. This is a way of saying, we endorse your state. We want the shoguns to continue ruling it. We will continue trading with you. You are our happy, friendly partners. It's deeply political, although in a religious context. Now, I have only one more slide to show you. I've uh, come to the end of my talk, talk but that sli this slide is um, a book on the theme of Nikko, very um, long and valued Historians much value this book. It has lots of information lost from other sources. Uh, Nikko Zan Shi. Shi is uh, Kokorozashi. It's not Rekshi no Shi. It's Kokorozasu. So, you know, um, a consideration of Mount Nikko. You might translate the title. Written by uh, Ueda Moshin, who knew Nikko very, very well indeed. He'd been there about 20 times and studied it in detail. Anyway, he produces this book. And amongst the many, many other things in it, he has a discussion of the lanterns. So here we have the the first one, although we have a detail of it, the second one on the stand, and the third one inside the um, housing. But if you look at it, can you see it's uh, rather um, small? Uh, this, it says um, Oranda, given by the Dutch. This says Ryukyu, given by the Okinawans. And this says um, Chosen, given by the Koreans. And so Nikko, which you may think of being, it was the kind of epicenter of the sanctity of the Japanese state under the shoguns, under their deified ancestor, who is the avatar of the Medicine Buddha, is um, entered via a kind of walkway of gifts of foreign kings, 
uh, which are all life prolonging lanterns, soliciting, uh, uh, um, requesting, hoping for the endurance of the shogunal state. Um, at which point I've come to the end of my allotted time. Um, I hope that was um, meaningful to you if you've been to Nikkor, and if you haven't, it will encourage you to want to go to Nikkor. It's one of my favorite places. Uh, and also, of course, um, Mount Kuno outside Shizuoka is also very much worth, worth going to see the original shrine. And I'll be very happy to take any, any questions that you might might have. <laughs>